As we were, six more members of the Oath Keepers have been convicted for their roles in the January 6th insurrection. A federal jury found all of them guilty of entering or remaining in a restricted building or grounds. In addition, four were found guilty of conspiring to obstruct an official proceeding. The judge ordered jurors to continue deliberating over the most serious counts against the other two defendants. Joining us now, NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley. He's been following the January 6th investigation since the very beginning in these cases specifically. Ryan, good morning. So tell us some more about these latest convictions and how they are a little bit different from the previous ones we've seen mm -hmm. with the Oath Keepers. That's right. So the first two Oath Keepers trial involved uh, charges of seditious conspiracy, and, and this trial didn't involve those. It's also been a lot less high profile uh, as a result, and I think also because of the fact that there's an unfolding uh, Proud Boys trial happening uh, in the D.C. federal courtroom right now. So you have these you know, two competing sort of trials, and the first, the second uh, Oath Keeper seditious conspiracy trial also overlapped with that other trial against members of the Proud Boys. So there's been a lot of activity at the courtroom, and, um, you know, there's been occasions where I've been sitting in on some of these cases uh, and have been the only reporter and only person in the room because there's just so many of these uh, cases that we're, we're sort of churning through right now. Um, but these individuals, uh, three of them, or rather four of them, were convicted of the top charge um, of obstruction of an official proceeding, and that was Sandra Parker, Laura Steele, Connie Meggs, and William Isaacs. Uh, there are two other individuals uh, who uh, the jury was still deliberating on that top charge for, uh, but they were convicted of sort of just like the base level charge, uh, which is uh, being present essentially on restricted grounds of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, the two individuals who were convicted of that didn't actually go inside the building, but they were one of thousands of people who were outside, and that's just sort of the layup case that you can get against anyone. In fact, if you wanted to charge thousands of people with that, you could charge that uh, against them because all of them are universally guilty of it. Uh, yeah. But that, uh, the, but ultimately, we might not end up with a more serious charge uh, against some of the against those two uh, defendants, including Michael Green, uh, who had actually testified on behalf uh, of Stuart Rhodes during uh, the first of the Keepers trial. So, Jay Johnson, we touched on this earlier in the show, but. Juries are returning convictions in these cases around the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Stuart Rhodes, that Ryan just mentioned, the head of the Oath Keepers, was convicted of seditious conspiracy. There are cases still pending out there against members of the Proud Boys, also for seditious conspiracy. Very serious charges. Yes, and there is something to be said for investigating and possibly prosecuting not just those who took to the streets, not just those who broke into the Capitol building, but those who incited the insurrection. Those in, in January 6th was the very definition of an insurrection. In my view, it's in the national interest that in prosecuting these cases, we call it what it was. You know, we read that the special prosecutor is contemplating oh. Charges for obstruction of the unofficial proceeding, fraud. This was an insurrection. You know, let, let's call it what it was. And the insurrection statute punishes not just those who participate in the insurrection, but those who incite it and give aid and comfort thereto. So in investigating former President Trump and others around him, uh, I think we really do have to call it what it is. I think it's in the national interest that we call That's it. That's what, what it makes is. this moment dangerous, Joe. Well, and, and, and the thing is, so here, see, you, do you know what you call this, what we're watching right now? It's a, it's a technical term. So for those of you not in television, I can understand what you don't understand, like you've never heard what we call this. We call this video, okay? We have a lot of video. And in the post truth world that Donald Trump inhabits and his supporters inhabit and people on cable news television that want to defend him inhabit, this video is held by millions and millions of people, especially because of social media. So if you lie about what happened on January 6th, if you try to re, uh, redefine it as, uh, you know, and, and try to redefine uh, Jonathan Lemire uh, say, saying, oh, the, the weird guy wearing the horns, or I don't know who, who people were trying to say, oh, he was just a peaceful guy and he never walked through a window. Boom! A couple seconds later, we got reporters like Mr. Riley who will say, well, actually, look at this video. Here he is walking through a, a, a broken uh, window. And so that's the thing. They don't understand that in this post-truth world that Donald Trump uh, lives by, 
and that they think they can live by. They don't understand that this is just a Jim and Tammy Faye Baker scam. He wants their money. He wants them to do his dirty bidding for him. And at the end of the day, he goes back to PTL land mm -hmm. and they go to jail. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, their lives are ruined because they broke the law and his life it just keeps going on because until now, Donald Trump is above the law. But again, make no mistake of it. You know, Fox News can try to redefine this any way they want to redefine this. Congressmen who were helping uh, uh, Capitol uh, cops from, from having people break through doors and shoot up the House chamber can lie about it a couple of weeks later and say that, oh, they're just tourists. But we've got something called video. And it shows still that it was a riot, it was an attempted insurrection, and they keep going to jail. And so for those who think they're going to screw with the NYPD today, stay on the other side of the bridge. It's not going to go well. Even if they come into New York City and break the law, they're going to jail. It's pretty simple. Break the law. Go to jail. There is no post-truth world Going to when Rikers. it comes to the court system, right? Pre-trial yeah. detention. No, certainly so. Yeah, the, Rikers. Uh, yeah. And by the way, one-way ticket to, somebody said it, Rikers. Jay Have Johnson. a good day. Mm -hmm. Over the long bridge there to Rikers Island. Yeah, there is certainly the NYPD specializes, particularly post 9-11, in real shows of force. And they safeguard major events. No city holds more of them. They'll be just fine uh, if an insurrectionist uh, show up either today or tomorrow. But to your point, yes, there's been a consistent effort to whitewash, to downplay what happened on January 6th by so many on the right. Yes, a leading cable news network and its top host, uh, as well as many figures in the Republican Party, lawmakers, some who have positions of real prominence now in the Republican-controlled House of Representatives. We're also seeing on the 2024 campaign trail, candidates, potential Republican candidates for president, are largely ignoring January 6th, except for a few comments from Mike Pence. No one using that as a, uh, as a, a means to attack Donald Trump to say he's not qualified for office because, of course, they are so afraid of alienating his supporters. But there is video, Joe. This is the most documented crime scene in the history of the United States. That's per the FBI. There is video. There is evidence. Those people are going to jail. And we should note there is an open investigation by Jack Smith, the special counsel, into Donald Trump's role that day, too. He is not out of legal jeopardy either. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley, thank you for bringing your reporting today. And former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, thank you as well. Thanks, Secretary. As we approach the first presidential election since the January 6th insurrection, we are seeing shadows of a resurgence of a far-right political movement of the past. Our next guest has a look at how the John Birch Society's teachings are being mirrored in the Trump MAGA movement. And joining us now, George Washington University professor Matthew Dalek. He's the author of the new book entitled Birchers, how the John Birch Society radicalized the American right. And Joe, I can't imagine better timing for this book. Well, you know, it's fascinating. There's an ebb and flow. Uh, when Ronald Reagan first started campaigning in 1966, a lot of John Birchers supported him. And he was told pretty early on that uh, he had to distance himself. And he he came out with a pithy statement. I, I, I know Matthew will know it far better than me, but something along the lines of, you know, if they support me, they're going to have to support my views, not, not vice versa. Uh, and Matthew, I'll tell you, when I was running in 1994, there were still John Birchers around. They, they weren't, uh, they, they, they were sort of kept at arm's length the same way Reagan kept them at arm's length, but they were still there in Republican politics. I think the biggest difference now is, the door has been opened unto them, and they're having a much bigger impact than they have in quite some time. You, you know, the thing I'm, I'm so struck by is the first 40, 50 minutes of your show, much of uh, what we heard from Ron DeSantis, uh, Donald Trump, other leaders of the Republican Party, strikes a birch key. Uh, the conspiracism, this idea of, of a George Soros plot, right, a, a, a Jewish uh, international figure, uh, the uh, the kind of uh, nativism and isolationism that we've seen come atop the GOP 
a lot of these ideas are the descendants of the John Birch Society. And you're right, Joe, right. they still, the, the Birchers still exist as an organization, um, although there, there are not many left. It's not like the 1960s when they were uh, right. really the, the epitome of far right extremism. Now it's mad. Well, and you know, the, the, the interesting thing, too, is and, and I really should have focused more on this as we went through the past five or six years. But now that you're talking about it, they would have these grand sweeping conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and it would be international Jewish bankers, just like Ron DeSantis is talking about now. But they would, you know, surrounding it all was this fear that the communists were coming to get us. Right. Yeah. But the deeper you dug into it when you would push back, just like on any of these Trump conspiracy theories, yeah, yeah, but wait a second, though. We yeah. were pushing back on communism, and we actually won the Cold War, because this was happening in 94 with me. We actually won the Cold War. And then they would say, well, yes, but the United States is part of the conspiracy, along with the communists, the deep state. They're working with the I go, well, wait a second now. So we fought a war against communism for a, a generation. We beat them. They're in total collapse, but somehow we're conspiring with the communists who we've been against. You get the idea because you know all of this. Yeah. But none of it made any sense. And I was like, OK. And yeah. then I would say, OK, let me talk about banning offshore oil drilling, everybody. And I'd go to another group of people. But it didn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, well, it doesn't. They're very hard to follow. Look. The most infamous conspiracy from the Birchers was Robert Welch's, the leader's idea that Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the president and, of course, the, the leader of D-Day, a, a, a war hero, a general, was a dedicated agent of the communist conspiracy. Um, and that, of course, uh, offended not just liberals, but many Republicans at the time. I mean, they, you know, how do you get from Eisenhower to communism? And the thing about these conspiracy theories uh, is that they're very adaptable, right? They're pliable. And so when the Cold War ended, what you see are people like Pat Robertson, for example, or Ron Paul, adapting versions of these Birchite conspiracy theories and weaving them to different ends. So Ron Paul, for example, spun this theory uh, about a North American union, that George Bush was basically conspiring with Mexico and Canada to create a NAFTA superhighway and create a, a, a North American union like the European Union. And George W. Bush actually, to his credit, rejected that and said, you know, I've been in politics a long time. I've seen this rodeo show before. You throw out a conspiracy <laughs> theory. They want you to they want you to refute it. But I'm not playing that game. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's impossible to refute. It's you know, the, the theories are so Byzantine uh, and they take a shard uh, of truth or, or evidence and they spin it into something unrecognizable. Matthew, is this a strand of thought in American political life that's just always there, that has always been there, and that gets tapped into by the Birchers or by the yeah. Tea Party or by MAGA or whatever from time to time? It has, yes, it's been there from the inception of the Republic. I mean, of course, we were founded in opposition to the central state. And so, you know, this idea that the, the federal government was going to take away our liberties is really deeply ingrained inside the United States. And so, you know, Joe, you referenced Trump's rhetoric about a deep state earlier. Well, that's similar not just to the John Birch Society, but to Joe McCarthy talking about the, the traitors inside the State Department. Or, you know, you can go back to the founding of the Republic or the 19th century, where they found conspiracy theories based in Washington or about international bankers. Um, and, and yes, there is, a, I think, within the country, and a lot of people have written about this, there is a kind of deep-rooted sense of uh, especially centralized powers, whether that's, you know, mass media or Washington, D.C., that is depriving people of, of wealth and their liberties. And look, Trump, in his final campaign ad in 2016, um, spun one of these. I mean, you can go back and watch the ad, and he talks about how globalists, and he flashes on screen, I think, three Jewish uh, uh, bankers, and says that the globalists are trying to, to take away uh, your wealth. They've been stealing your wealth and, and rigging the system on your behalf. And so uh, it's a very good question, and you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's really deeply American. Uh, and in, in some ways, though, the difference now is that it's just become more and more mainstream for a variety of reasons, some of which I get into the book. All right, the new book 
is Birchers, how the John Birch Society radicalized the American right. Matthew Dalek, thank you very much for coming on this morning. Well, let's start this morning right here in New York City in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office ahead of a possible criminal indictment of former President Donald Trump. Sources tell NBC News that law enforcement is bracing for modest protests in support of the former president today around Trump Tower and the DA's office. Yesterday, a handful of supporters responded to Trump's calls for mass protests over the weekend to, quote, take our nation back. Those came as prosecutors are reportedly zeroing in on a charge of falsifying business records in connection with a hush money payment Trump allegedly made to porn star Stormy Daniels in 2016 to keep her quiet about an affair she says the two had a decade earlier. Trump denies the affair and any wrongdoing. Sources say tomorrow is the earliest we could see an indictment. That's when the grand jury in the case reconvenes. Yesterday, the jury heard from Trump ally Robert Costello, an attorney who previously advised Trump's own one-time lawyer, Michael Cohen. Cohen, prosecutor's star witness in the case, was also brought in yesterday to be on standby as a possible rebuttal witness for Costello's testimony. But that rebuttal was never needed, even after Costello spent more than two hours trying to discredit Cohen before the grand jury. After his testimony, Costello, who also has represented the likes of Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon, told reporters he has no agenda except exposing the truth. Cohen later responded in an interview with MSNBC's Ari Melber. Did Rudy urge you to do this? No, I, I'm the one who decided to do this. A lot of people cautioned me against it because I had nothing to gain. The only thing I'm doing is trying to tell the truth to the grand jurors because I read all these lies in the, in the media that are being promoted by one side. It's a typical Donald J. Trump play out of the playbook. Figure out how you're going to muddy the water as best as you possibly can. Denigrate the person, disparage them. The district attorney has no. the documentation in order to validate every single statement that I've made and to basically um, dispel anything that Bob Costello has to say, which is probably, again, why they didn't need me for rebuttal. Meanwhile, Donald Trump continues to lash out at Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg and posts on his social media platform. The latest, a campaign-style attack ad, which repeats his most common claims about Bragg. I'm the only thing standing between the American dream and total anarchy, madness, and chaos. And that's what it is. I'm representing you. I'm just here. Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. That's what's happening. The ominous music and everything. In another post yesterday, the former president accused Bragg of breaking the law, writing that the DA should be held accountable for, quote, interference in a presidential election. So, Secretary Johnson, we can come back to that in a minute. I want to go back to the security question, though, something sure. you would be familiar with as a head of Homeland Security. What do you suspect is going on behind the scenes right now with the New York Police Department, Homeland Security, the FBI, Secret Service, everybody else? Well, first, it would appear from everything we, we see and hear that uh, if there's to be a court appearance by Mr. Trump, it'll probably be later this week at the earliest, possibly into next week. The grand jury is apparently still hearing testimony. They heard testimony from a witness yesterday. Uh, my recollection of grand jury practice is once all the evidence is in, the prosecutor gives the grand jurors some sort of instruction on the law. They then have to vote on the indictment. The indictment has to be handed down. Uh, and behind the scenes now, I'm quite sure, is a five-way negotiation between Donald Trump's lawyers, his Secret Service detail, uh, the DA's office, the court officers who are responsible for the security of 100 Center Street, and the NYPD. The NYPD, um, I suspect, is sort of leading the discussions about uh, where the appearance will occur, when it will occur, uh, will there be photographers, will there be press, so forth and so on. But that's a five-way negotiation. And the, I have a lot of confidence in the NYPD. Um, the NYPD, the court officers, 
are used to high-profile court appearances at 100 Center Street. Mm -hmm. None like this, however. This will be unprecedented, clearly. But the NYPD knows how to read social media, gather intelligence, anticipate crowd size, anticipate what level of security will be appropriate around 100 Center Street, assuming that's where this actually takes place. They're already setting up. Yeah, it, 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 see, it seems that on January 6th, uh, the Washington uh, Police Department, the city of Washington, Capitol Hill Police, uh, they were all caught off guard. Um, I think most of us that have spent some time in New York City can attest to the fact that you don't sneak up on the yeah. NYPD. <laughs> no. They got this, right? So if you come into New York City, we're, we're going to hide the guns right across the bridge, and then we're going to get the guns and bring them over to... Don't do that, because that's just going to mm. wheel real bad for you. Implications. This, this, this ain't, yeah, this ain't like leave the guns in Arlington and come to the cap. It's just not. You're in NY, you're in New York and you're dealing with the NYPD. So lots of luck there, fella. This morning, Chinese state media reports President Xi Jinping has invited Russia's President Vladimir Putin to an event in China later this year for an international forum called the Belt and Road Initiative. Putin attended both of the previous forums held by China in 2017 and 2019. This comes as the two leaders hold a second round of meetings today in Moscow. Look at that. Joining us now, National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications at the White House, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby. Kirby, I assume, uh, Admiral, uh, that the White House is watching this closely. What is the White House's response to this meeting so far? Yeah, we've been monitoring the best we can. Of course, we're not in the room, so we can't tell exactly what these two leaders are talking about. Uh, and we uh, made it very clear last week, Mika, that uh, one of the things that we'd be concerned coming out of this two-day meeting uh, is some sort of call for a ceasefire, because we believe mm -hmm. that that would just at this time ratify Russia's conquest. And we've also been very clear that uh, while these two nations can certainly have bilateral relations, we don't uh, view uh, this discussion or, or this burgeoning uh, closeness of these two countries uh, as anything more than a marriage of convenience. Uh, uh, President Xi finds in President Putin a useful foil for chafing or bristling or pushing back at U.S. leadership around the world, certainly uh, on the European continent. And President Putin needs President Xi because he's running out of ammunition. He's mm. running out of uh, of the kind of inventory that he needs to continue to fight this war. Um, and it's likely that he's going to be looking for more help from, from, from China. Uh, Admiral, President Xi and the Chinese government claim to have brought with them to Moscow a, a proposal for a resolution in the conflict of Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> President Putin said yesterday he viewed that with respect, whatever that means exactly. Do you believe yeah. that China, do you believe that President Xi has the power to influence Vladimir Putin over Ukraine? Uh, he certainly has influence over President Putin. There's no question about that because you can just see how aggressively President Putin has been seeking President Xi's approval uh, and President Xi's assistance in helping him fight this war in Ukraine. Now, whether he has that much influence over President Putin, I think remains to be seen. I will say this, Willie. To date, President Putin has shown absolutely zero interest in ending this war. And he could end it today. We don't even mm -hmm. have to go to the negotiating table. He just pull his troops out. Show no interest in doing that. Quite the contrary, he continues to bomb uh, innocent Ukrainian uh, citizens, continues to deport their children, continues to strike at their civilian infrastructure. So he has shown no indication. We're judging him on his actions, uh, not his words. And in fact, just visited Mariupol to reinforce yes. that Russia is in this for the long haul. So if not the influence of President Xi, if not the influence of China on President Putin, where do you all view this headed? Where do you view an uh, off-ramp as an overused term, but a way for this war to end if Vladimir Putin, frankly, just isn't listening to anybody? Well, given that he's not going to pull out and end the war today, uh, we all want to see this end as quickly as possible. The Ukrainians themselves would like to see this war end, of course, as, po as soon as possible. Uh, so we're going to keep working uh, with President Zelensky to help him actualize this idea of a just peace. You saw him put something out, a 10-point uh, proposal out in the, uh, in the summertime about that. We're going to help him and his team see if there's a way to actualize that. But also, we're going to make sure that we are teeing him up 
Zelensky for success at the negotiating table if and when it comes to that. We just announced mm. another package of support yesterday, mostly ammunition, missiles and uh, artillery ammunition to help them in the fighting that's to come. And make no mistake about it, Willie, for all this talk about peace and ceasefire, President Putin is making every intention known that he is going to re restart offensive operations here uh, in the spring when the weather gets better. We got to make sure the Ukrainians are ready for that, ready to defend themselves, but also ready to go on the offense themselves. Admiral Kirby, let's talk about this friendship, this lasting friendship between China and, and Russia. You know, when you first look at it, you would say, well, what helps or what hurts the United States helps China. And so maybe this war, maybe some people might say, well, this is uh, this is uh, hurting the United States. But it's actually isn't it hurting China more. Isn't peace in China's best interest? You look at the GDP of the United States, of Europe, the EU, of Japan, of Australia, of all of the people on our side yeah. in this conflict. It's over 50 trillion dollars a year. Yeah. You look at China's, it's 17 trillion. You look at Russia's, it's less than Texas by a good chunk. So how does this help China for this war to continue yeah. if they're going up against the, the richest, most powerful countries on the planet and their economy is sagging? No, you're absolutely right, Joe, and you really hit on a key point here. China's in a difficult spot, right? They would like to see this war end, too, because they don't want to see Russia go down in flames over Ukraine. They see Russia as a useful foil for American leadership elsewhere around the world. And that, that's the only reason why this relationship is persisting the way it is. Uh, President Xi sees President Putin as a, as a helpful aid in, in pushing back on the West. Uh, so he doesn't want to see Russia lose. He doesn't want to see the war go on. Uh, and he's trying to balance this uh, this competing need, which is why, if you look at China's position, Joe, they, they haven't condemned the war, but they haven't provided lethal weapons. Um, they haven't enforced the sanctions. They're still buying Russian oil and that kind of thing, but they haven't really enforced the sanctions. And even oh, a few months ago, you might recall at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, uh, President Xi publicly upbraided President Putin on the way he's executing the war. And he publicly criticized President Putin's nuclear rhetoric, the, the, the bombastic uh, talk that uh, Putin's put out there about the potential use for nuclear weapons. So President Xi finds himself in this weird position, wanting the war to end, but not wanting Russia to lose. Hey, Admiral, good morning. Uh, Jonathan Lemire. Uh, wanted, speaking of ammunition, as you know, as you just said, Russia hoping China will supply them with some, with some lethal military aid. But give us an update, if you will, about where Ukraine's munitions currently stand. They had really been sounding the alarm in recent weeks that yeah. they didn't have the weaponry, the supplies, and perhaps even the manpower needed to launch this spring counteroffensive. Can you give us a sense as to where they are right now on the eve of what could be this assault? Well, we're all mindful that uh, that they are uh, working through uh, their inventory uh, at a pretty fast clip here, particularly in the Donbass and this fighting over uh, Bakhmut. We also recognize that if they're going to be able to adequately defend themselves in the spring, let alone uh, or yet again go on the offense, they're going to need more. And that's why you saw in the package that President Biden signed out yesterday, uh, more uh, more rocket systems, more uh, artillery rounds, more obstacle clearing equipment, the kinds of things that we think they're going to need uh, in the spring and in the, in the fighting in the weeks and months uh, ahead. Uh, so we're mindful of, uh, of their inventory concerns. Uh, we're also marshalling ours as well to make sure we can preserve our national security interests. And we're working with allies and partners. And this is a key point. Uh, for them to help backfill some of these inventory needs that the that the Ukrainians have. We know it's going to be a, a tough uh, spring, uh, that both sides are going to come out slugging, uh, and we got to make sure that the, the Ukrainians can continue to punch above their weight. Uh, well, so the, the polls are helping. Obviously, Poland sent some MiGs over there. Uh, question is, uh, when can we get F-16s over to help the Ukrainians? Uh, and... I've got to ask you a question that I asked Hillary Clinton uh, when we were in Abu Dhabi, and she didn't have the answer, but I'm sure you will. Why does it take two years to get Abrams tanks over to Ukraine to help yeah. the Ukrainians push back against Russian aggression? And how, how can we speed that up? 
Okay, so two things here, F-16s and tanks, very, very different systems. Uh, the president's being clear that uh, that we're, uh, that for, for right now, uh, we're not looking at F-16s uh, to go to, to Ukraine. We are really, Joe, trying to prioritize on the kinds of systems that we know they're really going to need the most in the weeks and months ahead, and that's artillery, it's ammunition, it's air defense, uh, and, of course, it's armored capabilities. Okay, so that gets us to your question about tanks, because that's armored capability. Uh, the, the Pentagon's working as fast as they can, and I think they'll have more to say here soon about uh, about uh, adjustments they're making uh, to try to see if we can get uh, Abrams tanks to Ukraine a little bit faster than uh, previously expected. Uh, so we're working on that. There's uh, there's some some changes that you can make to the process uh, to sort of speed that up. And uh, again, I'll, I'll let the Pentagon speak to that. But uh, one of the things you got to consider with that is, I mean, these are very sophisticated tanks. Uh, first of all, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of them just sitting on the shelf. Uh, and to learn how to use that tank takes a lot of training. Just just for instance, the basic training on the Abrams tanks for American soldiers is 16 weeks long, and that's just the basic uh, training on how to operate it. Then you have to know how to maintain it, uh, and then you have to have a supply chain set up to, to actually keep the parts and supplies going while you're in combat, while you're fighting, and while these tanks are no doubt going to be taking some hits. So there's a lot that has to be considered. When we get them an advanced system, Patriot system is a good example for that, Joe. They're, they're, they just finished up training, Ukrainians training uh, on the Patriot battery in Fort Sill a couple of weeks ago. But when you get an advanced system like that in place, you want it to fall on ready hands. You want it to fall on a ready supply system and a supply chain that can handle it while it's being used in combat. And so that's what we're focused on. National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications at the White House, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby. Thank you very much. We start this hour in New York City and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office ahead of a possible criminal indictment of former President Donald Trump. Sources tell NBC News that law enforcement is bracing for modest protests in support of the former president today around Trump Tower and the DA's office. Yesterday, a handful of supporters responded to Trump's calls for mass protests over the weekend to, quote, take our nation back. Those came as prosecutors are reportedly zeroing in on a charge of falsifying business records in connection with a hush money payment Trump allegedly made to adult film star Stormy Daniels in 2016 to keep the porn star quiet about an affair she says the two had a decade ago, uh, earlier than that. Trump denies the affair and any wrongdoing. Sources say tomorrow is the earliest we could see an indictment. That's when the grand jury and the case reconvenes. Yesterday, the jury heard from Trump ally Robert Costello, an attorney who previously advised Trump's own one-time lawyer, Michael Cohen. Cohen, prosecutor's star witness in the case, was also brought in yesterday to be on standby as a possible rebuttal witness for Costello's testimony. But that rebuttal was never needed, even after Costello spent more than two hours trying to discredit Cohen before the grand jury. After his testimony, Costello, who also has represented the likes of Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon, told reporters he has no agenda except exposing the truth. Mm. I don't know, Willie. Do you see that as his agenda? How about Al Franken? Your take on That's Costello. a noble agenda. Yeah. Exposing yeah. the truth. That's what I try generally to do. speaking. Yeah. 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 He was uh, quite uh, loquacious during the press conference yesterday, getting into great drama about um, Michael Cohen's behavior. I think the only problem here is that um, it's not just Michael Cohen's testimony that the grand jury is looking at. They're looking at corroborating evidence and this and that. So you can discredit him as much as you want, but anything Michael Cohen put on the table, it's not like they're just taking that. Well, there's documentary evidence. Here's evidence of the payment. Here's the check. Here are the emails. They, they have all that. So they can, at the 11th hour, try to go after Michael Cohen's credibility, but the grand jury seems close to something here. So, Senator, as you watch all this play out in New York, we've been talking this morning about it potentially being the tip of the iceberg for Donald Trump mm -hmm. with so much still behind it that could be even worse for him in Georgia, January 6th, Marlon. Yeah, they're, 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 go down the list. How do you see all this playing out, and how does it hurt him if it does? I don't know what's going to happen. I, you know, just because Donald Trump said he was going to be arrested, his track record on no evidence of that, by the way, anything. Well, made up the day. Yeah, Tuesday. Well, of course, and he, and he could be, and he wanted to whip up his people. You saw the size of that demonstration on his behalf. 
It was about three people. Um, that it really is a crime. I mean, she he was trying to win that election and he wanted to cover that up. And she went to uh, National Enquirer and tried to sell the story. It got squashed. You know, this was about winning that election, and that's 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 a crime. The biggest crime, of course, is um, I had Lindsey Graham last yeah. night on. How did that go? It was fun. He and I are friends, kind of. And um, he, yeah, Voice said he was the funniest senator, which people like me hate. They hate to hear that, but he was very funny last night. But, you know, I, I, he agreed that the election wasn't stolen. And Trump knew the election wasn't stolen. And the number one agreement in our country is that you have peaceful transition of power. And then we made a bet. Uh, he said Trump is going to be the nominee. I said Biden is, and we made a $20 bet. And he said, okay, and may the, the winner of the election is the winner of the election. I said, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Right. That's the way it was supposed to be. Uh, Joe, jump in. Yeah, hey, Senator, so uh, talk about what it's like. Uh, you, you talk about Lindsay, but we all talk to senators. We talk to members of the House. They all trash Trump behind the scenes. The cameras turn on, and suddenly... They're his biggest champion. Can you can you just let our, our friends that watch the show in on just how widespread you found that to be during your, your time of service and beyond? Well, it was pretty uniform. Um, I, I told uh, when I tell people around the country that uh, Lindsay was a funny senator, I, I tell a story about in 16 when he's running against Trump and he's Lindsay's at about two percent. I'm in the Senate bathroom, and I turn to Lindsay, and I say, Lindsay, if I were a Republican, I'd, I'd vote for you for president. And Lindsay, without hesitation, just turned to me and said, that's my problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he hated he hated Trump at the time and said terrible things about him. And then and, and when he was elected, I, I have to say, my colleagues were shocked all down the line, uh, except for Sessions, I guess. And we uh, on the subway, you talk to Republicans and they couldn't believe it. But man, they fell in line because one, mm -hmm. if you didn't, you got clobbered, you and, know. And continue to fall in line. I mean, Lindsey Graham. And well, then, well, then Lindsey became his, you know, right. best friend and plays golf with him and uh, that's Lindsey. You know, Lindsey's a pretty s cynical guy too. One of, once I was going on, uh, uh, we were going on the winter vacation. He said, are you going to any place to take your family for sun? And I said, yeah, going to Puerto Rico. He said, do two fundraisers, one for the people who are for statehood, one for the people who are against statehood. They never talk to each other. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he's just, that's his that sense is... of humor. But, it, but it's all about how cynical he is. And, of course, Lindsay's from South Carolina. You want to get reelected, you got to be for, for Trump. He also wants to be in the action. And now he's the biggest uh, Trump supporter there is. And I mean, even on the night of January 6th, that's it. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. A couple of days later, back he gets in. harassed at, at National Airport and he's back. He's back on board. Well, so that, yeah, he keeps saying, look, I voted to certify. Well, he did on the 6th, but right. boy, oh boy. Yeah. There has been what sounds to us on this show a lot of wish casting that the party is moving past Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. that maybe Ron DeSantis is the alternative. Mm -hmm. Do you see any evidence of that? It's not in the polls. That's for sure. The party seems to be staying with Donald Trump despite everything we know about him and despite his track record. Do you talk to any Republicans who actually believe the party's moved past him? Uh, well, Lindsay doesn't. Uh, and you don't know. I mean, uh, DeSantis, you know. Scott Walker, you know, we've seen it before, and uh, I haven't seen him as a star yet. Who knows? So, um, no, there's no real reason to believe that a, a, a large, and of course, if they have primaries and, you know, they're winner take all primaries in, in, in the Republicans, so he could win primaries of 30%, like he did, in the last, and, and get the nomination. So I, I wouldn't, and, and do it while indicted. Mm. Joe. Now, S Senator, for you, uh, what, what do you think's at stake in the 2024 election if Donald Trump is uh, the Republican nominee? Oh, everything. Um, <clears throat> and I was basically saying this to Lindsay last night. 
the guy is a malignant narcissist. And, you know, he picked a few good people at the beginning of his administration last time. And they, when they went away, it was just one worse person after another. And, and the place was a kleptocracy. And he doesn't care about anything. He, look, he tried to, to, to he, had, he, he staged the coup. This is the worst possible person we could have in the White House. Uh, you know, d uh, Republicans who care about this country, if Bernie Sanders is running against Trump, they should go, oh, well, at least we want someone right. who believes in the country and believes in our system. And, and it, it, it's, it's a frightening prospect. I don't think he wins, but I, I'd rather someone else be Not the, take the, the nominee and lose. Yeah, <laughs> Let's bring sure. it to the Three years ago, the world was forever changed when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And today, we're still searching for our new normal as we rethink our careers, lives, and priorities. It has prompted many of us to ask ourselves, what's next and how do we get there? Our next guest, award-winning journalist Joanne Lippman, tackles those questions in her new book, which is out today. It's called Next, the power of reinvention in life and work. And Joanne is also former chief content officer at Gannett and former editor-in-chief at USA Today. Speaking of next, here you <laughs> go. Um, I love this for so many reasons, but let's talk about the timing. Well, there's always, it's always great timing for a book like this. Why now? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks, Mika. It's great to be here. And you're in the book. I this appreciate it. Fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, what next is, it's a deeply reported guide to navigating change in how we live, how we work, how we lead. And I literally wrote it for this moment in time because, you know, after this past tumultuous few years, we are looking for that new normal. We're reprioritizing. We're rethinking sort of, you know, our careers. We're looking for more meaning really in our careers and our lives. What I really want to do is empower people to feel like it's okay to change, to give them some tools to really navigate change in this very uncertain time. And we're working longer into our lives. We are, we are. I mean, it's really especially relevant now. I know you've been talking about this as well. We are no longer in a sort of 40 year career path, 40 years, retire at 65. We are now, kids coming in today, it's gonna be a 60 year career path. It's a whole other ball game. So there's gonna be plenty of room uh, for reinventing our careers, certainly multiple times. And you go through examples of, um, you know, people who've really made that, I mean, I guess to sort of give people the fact that there are many different roadmaps. I mean, you've got Alan Greenspan, novelist James Patterson, Chris Donovan, Jane Veron. Um, but I, these are incredible examples. I had so much fun reporting this book because uh, s some of the people there are bold face names that you will recognize. Some are not, but have equally remarkable stories. I mean, Alan Greenspan actually is one of my favorites because <laughs> he started out as a professional jazz saxophone player. Did you ever think? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had interviewed him um, a while back and he had actually told me he walked me through how he, um, as he was a professional jazz player, in, during the breaks he would do his bandmates' taxes. Oh my God, that's <laughs> and, and, hilarious. and he started looking forward to the breaks more than he did mm -hmm. the actual performance. Um, Ali, uh, uh, James Patterson is another one who I love. I actually first met James Patterson when I was a very young Wall Street Journal reporter. And he was an advertising executive and a struggling writer. And I asked him, I came back to him 30 plus years later to walk me through. How did you get from there to being this mega selling author? And I love how the message here is for men and women. Absolutely. It's, it's not like we have a different one in some ways, but in some ways we do. Um, but I love that you're speaking to everybody on this. Um, strategies for success, as I turn my phone off here. I love these. <laughs> First of all, let's just go through a couple of these. Sure. Move before you move. What do you mean? Uh, so it's so fascinating that Almost everyone who I spoke to who had a major transition actually started on that path long before they even realized it, right? They started sort of moving. It could, if you change your career, for example, it might have been um, like a side hustle or a right. hobby or just a random interest. But people generally don't necessarily know where they're going to transition to. 
but their interests are taking them there already. Imagine your possible selves. Yeah, I love this one. This is a psychological term, but if you think about who you might be, could be, uh, want to be, it's the first step, but it's not enough to just think about it. You actually have to take action. So you want to write it down, share it with another person, or take action, like take a course or shadow someone on their job. I, I'm jumping around here, but I love the last two uh, that I see here. Take a break and create a CV of failure. I can, I've done that. I've got one. It's, it's like a <laughs> scroll. It would like roll out into the floor. <laughs> so the CV of failure is such a brilliant idea. It's basically you are taking everything, every job you didn't get, everything that you muffed, every assignment that went wrong and you make a list of it and what it does first of all it just shows you it makes you feel better because everybody fails everybody they're, fails they're stepping stones is what yes they are. yes but it also it gives you data so i spoke to a scientist for example who created a cv of failure and what she said is it it taught her not only all the things she tried, but it also showed her all the ways that she was failing. And she was a biologist, and she said she realized she was failing in the lab, but she was succeeding. It showed her where she succeeded mm -hmm. with computational biology, and it made her switch her career focus. So it can help you understand your strengths. And if I could mention one more, because it's yeah. related, is I love this idea of an expert companion. Yeah. So an expert companion, which I, another term I am borrowing this from actually trauma psychologists, but we all need an expert companion. It is the person who can see you objectively, who can look at you and say, these are strengths you have. This is progress you've made. The cool thing about this is so often the strengths are best strengths are innate and we don't even realize we have them and it's great to have somebody else to reflect that back to you. Uh, Joanne Lippman, author of Next, The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work. Thank you very much for coming on. Congratulations on the book. It's amazing. It's been called the most important election this year because it could decide the future of abortion rights, redistricting and more in a key battleground state. Voters in Wisconsin can cast their ballots starting today in the state's high-stakes Supreme Court race. And later today, Republican-backed Dan Kelly will face off against Democrat-supported Janet Protasiewicz for the first and only debate just two weeks before Election Day. Whoever wins the April 4th election for a seat vacated by the retirement of a conservative justice will determine majority control of the court for at least the next two years, including leading up to the 2024 presidential election. The Wisconsin Supreme Court came within one vote of overturning former President Donald Trump's defeat in 2020, and this year's election is expected to be tight, with the minority vote seen as, a, as crucial in a state where about 80 percent of the population is white. Joining us now, Academy Award-winning screenwriter and founder of No Studios, John Ridley. He grew up in Wisconsin and held an event last week with young people to help turn out the vote. Ridley, it's great to see you again. Um, obviously, your home state, but tell us what compelled you to get involved in this way. Uh, as you say, Mika, it's, it's where I was born and raised. Uh, my parents still live in Wisconsin. My parents were about service. My father was a doctor who served in the U.S. Air Force. My mother is a teacher. Her younger sister, uh, Beth, her family still lives there. And with my older sister, Lisa, as you mentioned, we started No Studios, which is really about art and activism. And over the last year, we've held debates with the gubernatorial, the Republican gubernatorial candidates. Uh, we held Q&As with Senator Ron Johnson, as well as Governor Tony Evers as well as a Q&A with both of the candidates, Dan Kelly, as you mentioned, and Janet Protasiewicz, which is uh, as someone from Wisconsin that is a very good, durable <laughs> Wisconsin name. So we had a Q&A with them with uh, WISN in Milwaukee. And this really is an important election. Mickey, you mentioned it all. Reproductive rights, the laws in Wisconsin date back to 1849. So before members mm. of my family were free people, these laws about women's rights were in place gerrymandering, gun control, um, potentially overseeing elections. All of that is on the ballot. And in Wisconsin and, and frankly, across America, unfortunately, young people are more likely to go to concerts, 
than they are to vote. So among the things that we're doing, we're part of the I Voted Festival. More information about that, go to ivotedfestival.org. People should vote no matter what. But if you vote, if you show that you are a voter, you can go to free concerts across Wisconsin. We want to get people out. This is important. We know people are tired of hearing about every election is an important election. But that's the truth. And if we don't engage and we're not part of the process, things won't change. However you believe, whether I agree with you or not on the policy, vote. Be part of the process. Yeah, you know, John, Wisconsin really is 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 just the heart of so many challenges. And it, when Democrats, you know, a couple of years ago were complaining about this happening or that happening and how could this be? I'd say, you know what? Republicans have gerrymandered the state. Republicans focus on local yeah. politics. Republicans focus on this sort of stuff. So if you didn't like the jury instructions in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, Jesus didn't write those yeah. instructions. They didn't come down from <laughs> high. It was by the state legislature who was elected by local people. If you don't like the fact that Democrats always outperform against Republicans and uh, compared to how many seats they get in the state legislature, well, again, don't blame the gods, blame yourself. And so I, I can't think of a state that's more important for people who care about representative democracy uh, and, and who hate gerrymandering to focus on than Wisconsin, because it's as bad as it gets. Yeah, Wisconsin, Joe, is probably the swingiest of swing states. As mentioned, uh, Senator Ron Johnson, very conservative Republican, was reelected by a wide margin. At the same time, Governor Tony Evers, very progressive Democrat, uh, uh, in my opinion, a great guy, was also reelected. So you see a lot of people who are uh, splitting votes, crossing line to vote for the person who they believe in. And also, just an indication of how important Wisconsin is to the national landscape. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Democratic National Convention was meant to be held in Milwaukee because of the pandemic. Uh, it was held virtually. It wasn't held in person. But in the next presidential election cycle, the Republican National Committee is holding their convention in Milwaukee because how Wisconsin goes and, and you know, look, this is truism. We know we're focused on Georgia, Michigan, places like that. Wisconsin is as purple as it gets. And both sides want to really plant their flags and, and, and try to drive that vote. You mentioned the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, situation. You know, I was in Wisconsin um, during the first shooting. A black man was shot in his back seven times by police officers. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse um, used a, a, a self-defense um, uh, in his defense, talking about uh, self-defense, even though he was underage and carrying a gun at that time. You know, Wisconsin is full of stress points. I love that state. It is my home state. It is where I'm from. I return there to have a business for a reason. But all of these issues are incredibly important. And there was an active effort. And in fact, Republicans talked about it with pride of how they tried to suppress the vote in Milwaukee. As Mika mentioned, 80 percent of the population in Wisconsin is white, wonderful people, great people. But there are opportunities to really divide people in that regard. We can't have that again where people are actively suppressing the vote. Again, I may not like how that vote goes, but there's a difference between saying to everyone your vote counts or luxuriating, truly luxuriating the fact that you stopped people from voting. That's not right. John, it is so great to see you, my friend. I know you miss sitting next to me as much as I do to you at 4 o'clock in the morning in Secaucus, New Jersey, 15 years ago. But it's great to have you back on the show. Um, you mentioned the Senate race there with Ron Johnson. Another one coming up, by the way, with Tammy Baldwin uh, fighting to keep her seat in 2024. We'll see how that race plays out. want to get your smart brain on the bigger uh, stuff playing out that we've been talking about this morning as well. Uh, We've got a Manhattan D.A. potentially going to indict Donald Trump. We've got a, a case down in Georgia as well with the Fulton County D.A. down there. We've got January 6th. We've got the Mar-a-Lago documents all out in front of this former president and also now a House of Representatives controlled by Republicans who are looking to rally defense around Donald Trump, talking about the, quote, weaponization of the federal government, the weaponization yeah. of the district attorney's office. What do you hear when you hear that term? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to be very, very calm. And, and Joe, 
Mika Willie, you, you know I have been writing about policing and community going back to uh, an article I wrote in, in Esquire. Um, people may have challenged the direction I came from. They never challenged the facts. When I hear, and I want to be careful how I say this, because I, I don't want to paint with a, a, a wide brush or try to indict all white folks, but when I hear from privileged white men talking about the weaponization of the law, they don't know what they are talking about. <laughs> As a person of color, as a black man, the law has been weaponized against us, going back to the Constitution and being considered three-fifths of human beings. What do you call slavery? What do you call failed reconstruction? Jim Crow, segregation. If you are an Asian American, the Chinese Exclusion Act, that's weaponization. Um, Executive Order 9066 is weaponization. I'm not going to explain what that is. I'm sure Professor Ron DeSantis will tell you all about that. Um, if he won't, you won't read it about books in school. But individuals talking about the weaponization, you know, as, as black and brown people, we're told that part of the problem with negative interactions between community and police is because we don't comply. We don't listen. We don't appreciate law enforcement. We don't care about this country. But the moment that the process is in play, as it should, I don't know if Donald Trump is guilty or not. But I know that the court of law is where an individual goes to literally have their day. And when it happens to them, when the process is presented, all of a sudden, whoa, it's being weaponized. It's being turned against me. You know, you have Kevin McCarthy, you have Jim Jordan say, hey, we want you to come in. And they're saying this to Alvin Bragg. Come in and answer questions. That's what the court is for. And I have a bigger problem. And again, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. But when you have the Kevin McCarthy's of the world saying to a black prosecutor, you need to come in and answer questions. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're not living on the plantation anymore. He has yeah, no yeah. right, no reason to ask this individual to come in and answer questions when that is what the court is for. That is what juries are for. That is what evidence is for. That is what grand juries are for. Not for Kevin McCarthy, not for Jim Jordan, who, by the way, when they're asked to answer questions, when you literally see a white riot and they don't want to talk about that, yet don't switch the game on us. Don't flip the script. And I would hope, uh, Mr. Bragg, well, I, I hope that he obeys the law and respects the law as we do. Again, Joe, my father served in the U.S. military. He didn't hate this country. Uh, I had an uncle who was a Tuskegee Airman. My father-in-law, despite the fact that his family was interned in the Japanese internment, served his country. We don't hate this country. We love it. We love it with our flesh. We love it with our blood. We love it with our vote. But what we have problems with is when the law is turned against us, when the law is used as it uh, chooses to be used by the prevailing culture. So, again, I'm not trying to go off. I'm not trying to say this is representative of all white folks anywhere. It is not. But we see it. We see it, and it's painful. It's painful to us. Like myself, I, 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 I believe sometimes I failed to serve my country in the way that I could have, but I'm happy for the ways that I do it with no studios. I'm happy with the ways that I do it to get people to vote. But it's painful and hard to do that when we see moments like this playing out in front of our eyes. Well, think about yeah. this, John. You have those Republicans you're talking about ignore subpoenas. They just ignored subpoenas. And now those same Republicans yeah. are saying to a black DA, we're going to subpoena you. you. Come on in here. Come on in here. You, you got to talk to us. We, 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 we got some things to say to you. Think about this fact. And I, I've, I, I've spoken about this on the show, and I find it remarkable that it took this country from 1776 to 1965 to actually yeah. begin moving toward being a more perfect union. We're still moving in that direction. As Reverend Al says all the time, we've made extraordinary gains over the 50, over 50 years. We have a long way to go yet to be that more perfect union. But like you said, there's a lot to love about this country. You love this country. 